And our next speaker is Joshua Elliott. Uh, Joshua has an inter interesting pedigree, trained as a high energy particle physicist. He now is works on issues of climate and uh, agriculture at the University of Chicago. Joshua? Thank you very much, John. You had to mention the physicist. Yes, now they'll expect things from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to thank um, you know, the organizers and especially Madhu for this exciting opportunity and for including me with this very esteemed group. I really appreciate it. I had originally tried to, um, to fit this talk within the, you know, the nice constrained binary of this session of just water and agriculture, but I, I quickly abandoned that um, uh, for a much broader approach, and I'm glad I did because uh, after the session this morning, uh, I, I think uh, it's, it uh, is good to, to cover much, a much broader uh, set of topics. And, uh, so I'm going to talk about irrigation and adaptation in agriculture, but really I'm going to talk about water and carbon and climate and nitrogen and phenology and nutrition and just about everything I can squeeze into uh, this next 25 to 45 minutes, whatever it's. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start out uh, for motivation. Uh, I'll go through a series of of uh, recent and current and future projects. We'll start out with motivation uh, with a project that uh, we did in, um, in 2012 uh, that was um, kicked off by a group at the Potsdam Institute called the Intersectoral Impacts Model Intercomparison Project. It was ostensibly a, a fast track project, but that sort of uh, belies the I extreme rapidity with which it was performed. So it was kicked off in February of 2012 and culminated uh, just 11 months later with um, a really extraordinary amount of work produced uh, included 40 modeling groups from four sectors, including both biophysical and agroeconomic models in agriculture, uh, water models, biomes, and health. Uh, included uh, um, models, five GCMs from CMIP5, four RCPs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and culminated in a, in a, a, a special issue of PNAS that uh, came out last year. I'm going to talk about a few of these papers, not all of them, and a few others, uh, just to, to set the stage. And, and I also want to advertise that. Um, all of the inputs and outputs and everything you could possibly hope to learn from this project are available uh, openly and online through a number of different sources, including an Earth Systems Grid node at, uh, at PIC and a, a Globus endpoint uh, that I've set up at, at Argonne. Um, so just quickly, an overview of the agriculture sector. We already learned a lot of the stuff this morning, but I, I want to quickly uh, try to focus on um, some of the the, uh, the, the, the complexities of these interactions and the extreme uncertainties and the sources of those uncertainties and why I, I think this is such a big deal that we need to worry about. So, so the, this is the, uh, the, the first paper we did for that study, which is an overview of the agricultural sector. Um, and I'm first going to try to give it context in the context of uh, the results from AR4. So the first thing we did was um, to, to, to try and compare the results from, this, uh, um, from, from seven global, uh, global uh, agricultural models um, uh, from over the next um, over the next hundred years um, to the uh, the synthesis results that were produced as part of AR4. So the orange dots there and the orange line is just a direct reproduction uh, of the results from from AR4. Uh, the 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 gray bar the gray band is the is the range of results produced as part of this uh, the the EasyMIP study. And the the red and green lines are are are, are subsets of those models. Um, and, and this gets to my first point about the uncertainties and interactions between these, these different components of, of, of the problem. So the, the, uh, the, the red line is models that, that do consider explicit nitrogen stress, and the green line is models that do not consider explicit nitrogen stress. And you can see that there's a fundamental distinction, and this has started off a lot of the uh, analysis that we subsequently uh, produced here. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss a lot more about where this distinction comes from and what it means for our assessments of of, of, of climate impacts and, and how we respond to them. Uh, again, additionally, from the same, from the same work, we looked at uh, doing a, a global assessment and trying, in uh, likely in vain, but trying to at least make a first effort of, at, at putting some sort of uh, confidence on these, on these assessments and actually producing a hatched map of where models agree and disagree. I think it was the, the first effort anyone has ever produced at trying to do that. Um, Again, uh, you know, the uncertainties here are huge and, the, and it's very, very difficult to, to do this, but we wanted to at least make an effort in this fast track project. 
And again, you can see we have divided it again by models with explicit nitrogen stress and models without. And you can see, you know, just to show the lots and lots of red on the left and lots and lots of blue on the right, there's a, a huge disagreement between models of these types. And so we want to understand more about what that comes from. So um, the, next, the next work we did, which was, was uh, to look at, uh, we took the opportunity of having these consistent ensemble of 11 different global hydrological models um, and six different global uh, crop models um, to try and see if we could compare anywhere between these sectors. So uh, the one variable in the entire project that, that we could find that was actually produced uh, across these different sectors, across these very, very different types of models was in fact irrigation demand and consumption was of course irrigation demand is crucial to getting the global hydrological cycle right and it's also crucial to understanding uh, the, the future impacts of, of, um, uh, of climate on agriculture. Um, so what, what, what I plotted here is the, the distribution, the gray shows the distribution from the global hydrological models of the total irrigation demand uh, indexed at zero from, from now into the, over the next hundred years under an RCP 8.5 scenario for, for all five GCMs. You can see that global hydrological models generally produce, produce, uh, predict a significant increase in the demand for irrigation over the next, over the next 80 to 100 years, uh, ranging anywhere from 20 to 45 percent increases. Uh, the green, similarly, is, uh, is um, the, same, the same prediction out of the global crop models without considering the impacts of increasing atmospheric CO2, so without considering any CO2 fertilization effects. And finally, the yellow bar is the, is the, is the crop models with considering uh, the effects of increasing CO2. So the, the storyline here is basically global hydrological models uh, um, to, with, almost, with only one exception do not consider the effects of increasing CO2 on, on uh, crop water use efficiency and so therefore dramatically over predict or, or tend to, to over predict um, the demand for irrigation in the future. As, as, temperatures, uh, as temperatures and CO2 rise. And the, the global crop models, at least in this scenario, which uh, uh, I, I will admit we used uh, what Madhu uh, eloquently described earlier as the dumb farmer scenario, which is obviously unfortunate, unfortunate but it was a fast track project, so that's all we did, um, uh, it, it, uh, tend to show a, a, rather, a rather significant decline in the amount of irrigation demand on current, currently irrigated areas. And this is uh, uh, partly due, as I said, to the effects of increasing crop water productivity due to increasing atmospheric CO2, but also partly due to the fact of, of shortening growing seasons as temperature increase, growing seasons get shorter, and the amount of irrigation demand gets smart. Of course, we know that farmers are not dumb, they're actually quite smart, and that they will change the, the varieties they're planting to actually compensate for that decreased growing season. So the true answer, uh, as, is, as is always the case in these sorts of things, is somewhere in between here, and I, I won't even attempt to tell you where, but it's somewhere in between these. Um, similar, so we, we uh, uh, finally in that same work we combined uh, these results to try and look at across the globe um, as, as we heard over and over again this morning, uh, food security and water use is, is a local issue. So we looked at these results at the, at, the, at the watershed level from both the crop and hydrological models to try and get some sense for where um, constraints of freshwater availability are likely to exacerbate climate change in future and in what watersheds uh, um, uh, surplus water availability may be used as an adaptation mechanism. Um, the, the map at the top shows uh, watersheds in red in which, um, in which a, um, uh, a lack of availability of fresh water according to, according to the projected demands from the crop and hydrological models uh, is, is predicted to cause a reduction in the amount of ca uh, calories produced. And similarly, the green are regions in which a surplus of water availability could actually, could actually support the conversion of rain-fed agriculture to irrigated agriculture and thus an increase in the total agricultural productivity in those watersheds. And in total, um, what we found in the project is that with including the effects of CO2, the direct effects of climate change had something about a four, 400 to 1400 petacalorie um, loss uh, of, um, of productivity. Um, on current agricultural lands with no change in, in, in irrigated areas, which is about 8 to 24 percent of present day calorie production. Uh, without CO2, that effect, of course, uh, that direct effect is, of course, much, much more severe, 1,400 to 2,600 petacalories. In the, if you add up all of the, the red watersheds here on the map, um, you find that the, the amount of, of irrigated land that could be forced to converted to, to rain fed by the end of the century 
uh, implies the reversion of between 20 and 60 million hectares of irrigated cropland globally um, by 2100, which implies a further loss of between 600 and 2900 petacalories of food production. So roughly the same order of magnitude as the direct climate effect uh, just from the effects of constrained irrigation water availability. Uh, finally, um, with all of the uh, potential surplus, if you imagine the completely most optimistic case with uh, free water transport and everything else you could hope for, um, net globally, you find that, that uh, uh, maximal water usage could support a net increase in irrigation, which could actually ameliorate somewhere between 12 and 57 percent of the caloric production loss. And this is summarized in the, 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 the further chart here. Um, which simply shows the, the, the four different scenarios considered. Climate impacts with, uh, without CO2, the, the most severe black bar there on the right, uh, with C, without CO2 and with uh, a net expansion of irrigation in orange, the gray bar is climate direct impacts with CO2, and finally the yellow bar, the most optimistic case, which is direct impacts with CO2 effects and a net expansion of irrigation globally. Um, finally, just wrapping this up, another paper that's in, prep or that's in review from the same project um, is trying to look at the interactions between um, uh, CO2, and, uh, CO2 and, uh, and crop water productivity. So as, as I said, uh, the, the fundamental uh, uh, uncertainties and, and, uh, that, that, that we discovered in this project was uh, a disagreement between models that um, that do consider nutrient stress and nitrogen stress specifically, and models that, that do not. And that was determined to come from the fact that um, CO2 effects were found to be uh, twice as strong in, in models that don't consider nutrient stress because, of course, they weren't nutrient limited in those regions and, and, and uh, exacerbated those effects. We wanted to look similarly at what the effects of, um, the effects of CO2 and water were. So we did a, a, a further analysis looking at crop water productivity. We found that uh, with, with CO2, crop water productivity uh, was modeled to increase in future uh, from between uh, 6 to 17 percent. And without CO2, it was modeled to decrease severely between 14 and 28 percent. We also found that the uncertainty between these models, as I said, increased dramatically when CO2 effects were considered. Uh, consistent with the fact that the, the actual representation of CO2 fertilization effects within these models is by far the largest, continues to be by far the largest uncertainty within the system. We also did some analysis comparing with, uh, with face data, which, we dis which was discussed earlier, um, found um, uh, good consistency between the model outputs on crop water productivity and the limited data available on, uh, on crop water productivity from the face experiments. Um, so that's reasonably comforting. Uh, finally, one last paper from that study that I want to mention is uh, a, we took all of the outputs of the agricultural study and fed these into an ensemble of 10 or 11 different uh, global agricultural uh, agroeconomic models to try and look at some of the, uh, some of the, the, the human responses and adaptation and price effects. Um, so I will attempt to tell you what these acronyms mean. The exogenous yield factor, you can see, which is just the direct outcome of the, of the models, was, was 10 to 25 percent. The total yield, which is the exogenous yield plus the adaptation factor, uh, changes area, area increases, production, et cetera, doesn't change, and then price increases from somewhere between 1 and 60 percent, which is always a nice sort of economic result when you get somewhere between 0 and 100. So that's good. Um, Great. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, finally, uh, we recently, um, colleagues of mine at, at PIC and I uh, did a, a, a short note based on um, the Myers paper that Andrew was also a part of that he mentioned uh, this morning um, to look at how CO2 interacts not just with water and not just with nitrogen, but also with um, uh, the nutrient contents of plants, as, as was mentioned briefly earlier. And, and how, how that's likely to evolve in the future under, under uh, climate and CO2 changes. So just a very simple uh, look at, I'll just tell you these cute little plates here and how they're changing in the future. So um, if you imagine that the, the size of this plate is proportional to the total global calorie production and that each plate's quadrant is based on, uh, um, each plate's uh, section is based on it, it, its 
collection of nutrients, where we're considering here protein and zinc and iron. Under climate change, under RCP 8.5, with no CO2 fertilization effects, you get 20 to 25 percent reduction in, in caloric production, which is the red band, the big thick red band there at the top. With CO2 effects in that RCP 8.5 by end of century, most of those, most of that caloric production loss is, reserve, is reversed. However, you end up with between 20 and 25 percent reduction in the caloric content of zinc and iron and uh, protein. Um, uh, according to those results, so it's 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 a you know potentially a a, a very difficult trade-off that needs to be considered. Okay, so the one thing that I've neglected to talk about that I'm just going to mention very very quickly is of course extremes and drought, which is another uh, uh, crucial thing that interacts strongly with this. So, um, uh, so we we uh, did. Um, a little bit of work. I don't want to go into this in too much depth because it's it's very much off topic. But um, this is a, a um, so everyone here knows why to worry about drought. Of course, we live in Illinois. We worry about drought all the time. Um, dr large scale drought and heat events accounted for 12% uh, of all the billion dollar disasters disasters in the U.S. from 1980 to 2011, but uh, accounted for almost 25% of the monetary damages. The 1988 U.S. drought, which is uh, the most costly in recent history, is estimated to have cost almost $80 billion. And, uh, and, and further, uh, uh, many people expect that warming temperatures uh, uh, and shifting precip may exacerbate this problem. And uh, I mostly like to, 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 to show this quote at the bottom uh, because it comes from uh, a very nice piece by uh, Joseph Rahm uh, about the dust bullification of America. And I just like to say the word dust bullification. But so if you're not familiar with dust bullification, um, check out that piece. Um, so we looked at, uh, in the context of the U.S., which is, of course, a very data-rich region, to see uh, what models could tell us about, uh, about extremes in the, in the U.S. and about how system-wide robustness to extremes has evolved over the last three decades. So this is just um, uh, showing here uh, a single model output of, uh, of crop yields at, um, at county level. Uh, for 1988 and 2012, uh, based on technology in 1988 and 2012, um, we uh, and and we, you know, similarly compared this to NAS data for validation, and then we constructed two different counterfactual scenarios in which we simulated the results of the 1988 drought hitting in 2012 and the 2012 drought hitting in 1988 to see whether or not there is any, uh, uh, we, we can say anything about the system level sensitivity and how it's changed uh, uh, in, in the convening years. Uh, what we found was that if uh, the 2012 drought was in fact, despite the fact that it, uh, it impacted yields less severely than did the 1988 uh, drought, it, it was in fact far more severe. Uh, we found that if the, if the 2012 drought had hit with 1988 technologies and management, um, uh, the losses in yields would have approached almost 30 percent. Um, and, but whereas if the 1988 drought had hit in 2012, losses would have only been 18 percent, which roughly translates into about a 25 percent reduction in system-wide drought sensitivity in the U.S. corn industry over the last um, 30 years, which is certainly a pretty significant change. Okay, uh, finally, now I want to talk about um, uh, what we're wanting, what we're trying to do to address uh, these these very deep issues of uncertainty and the uh, and the the, the highly nonlinear interconnections between carbon, temperature, water, and nitrogen, and nutrients, and extremes, and everything else. Um, uh, and this is the, the extension of that, uh, that very rapid fast track project we did in 2012 and 2013, which is called the Global Graded Crop Model Inter Comparison, uh, which is conducted uh, uh, th through the, um, the AGMIP organization, A Agricultural Modeling Inter Comparison and Improvement Project, in partnership with uh, the EasyMIP folks I mentioned earlier. Um, this, uh, we're currently uh, in the final stages of what the, the, fa the first phase of this project, which is uh, involves uh, between 12 and 15 models from around the world, each modeling between 4 and 16 crops, considering nine different historical climate forcing products spanning the last 60 years uh, globally for uh, many different um, harmonized and, and unharmonized um, management scenarios. 
to really try to do, for the first time ever, a very detailed intermodel comparison and, more importantly, a very detailed model validation and evaluation of these models over the historical period in order to see how well we can actually reproduce the past with these models that we're frequently um, using to try and predict the future. Uh, just here's a, a quick summary of um, some of the, the, uh, the climate forcing products that were used over the historical period um, and, uh, and uh, the variations between those just to get a, a sense of the kinds of, uh, of changes even at large scale aggregation levels that you, can, that you can get between these climate forcing products, even ones that are ostensibly uh, supposed to be reproducing the past. So, we use uh, nine different climate forcing data sets uh, uh, here to drive the models. Um, and here we're showing temperature on the left and, rain and rainfall on the right averaged over wheat, rice, maize, and soy areas. And you can see that even for temperature, which we expect these reanalysis models and, uh, and um, bias corrected reanalysis based products to reproduce quite well, you can get some uh, fairly severe differences um, between the different model products. Uh, especially relevant for rice areas, um, due primarily to, to differences in resolution of these products and how that causes uh, issues around um, uh, areas with, with severe slope, which of course uh, is mostly means for rice. Uh, finally, the next phase of the project, which we are uh, just about to start this fall, um, is, is um, trying to really and truly finally get at uh, the, the, the very challenging problems of, un, uh, of uncertainty that I've been mentioning throughout, uh, which is a detailed uh, full four-dimensional study of the space of CO2, temperature, water, and nitrogen, which we call the CTWN. Um, so using this, uh, this ensemble of global models, of 12 to 15 global models, to study uh, the model's response and the interactions uh, between carbon temperature, water, and nitrogen, the goals of this project are obviously to understand model processes and uh, accelerate model uh, improvement, and also to develop lightweight statistical emulators in order to improve downstream model coupling, coupling to agroeconomic models and to other applications. And an example of that is shown here on the right. So this is just simple cross sections of a, of a carbon temperature and water uh, emulator showing uh, the, uh, the response of yield uh, to, to slices along precipitation and temperature. CO2 and precipitation and, and temperature and CO2. And then finally, the next stage of the project in 2015 and 2016 will be a, um, uh, a, a new uh, global, a global assessment of climate impacts um, to, to, to agriculture and other sectors conducted in partnership with the, the EasyMIP folks at PIC. Um, this has been in planning over the last uh, year or more. It's going to include, I think, something like nine different sectors, um, 100 different modeling groups from around the world, uh, with a focus on extreme, event, extreme events, both in the historical and future period, uh, adaptation options and scenarios, um, improving cross-sector interactions and land use change analysis, um, and adding also a regional focus at the watershed level, and you can see some of the, the regions that we're going to be uh, focusing on there in the map on the bottom um, for detailed analysis there. And uh, finally, I just want to end with a, uh, uh, an invitation to get involved, um, if, uh, to get involved in uh, some of the global assessment products. Uh, contact myself and my partner, uh, uh, Christoph Mueller from the Potsdam Institute. Uh, if you also want to get involved in AgMIP, which is a fantastic community shown there at the top, or in EasyMIP, which is a fantastic community shown there at the bottom, um, uh, please do get in touch with us or with one of those groups. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much.
Okay. One of the things that you suggested that in the last, uh, last, uh, last uh, 25 years there is uh, less vulnerability to uh, drought. What is the reason? Is it uh, because uh, people use, uh, <clears throat> use, for example, the trait of uh, the, the root worm uh, trait? Is it because of adoption of drip irrigation? Is it because of irrigation scheduling? It, it seems to me that you are strong on throwing numbers, but if I'm a farmer, what do I learn from it? It's, that's a good question, and that's, that's uh, something that we're looking at now. Is so the, the scenarios that we constructed, sorry, the scenarios that we constructed to look at that over the last 30 years, calibrated to uh, historical NAS data, um, only looked at uh, five or six key um, uh, technology drivers: uh, planting, planting dates and growing season lengths, um, uh, and thesis timing, um, a, a number of different cultivar factors. Uh, uh, kernel numbers and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we haven't dug in to look at which, what specific factors are driving the changes. Uh, there's also a, a, a significant part of it is driven by uh, land use changes and increased irrigation usage over, over the U.S. Corn Belt in the last 30 years. Um, but again, it's, it's a good question. And we're, again, we're looking at, the, the, that work doesn't really have any specific suggestions for farmers because we're looking at system level sensitivity rather than farm level sensitivity. And in fact, you know, there are some recent results that farm level sensitivity, in fact, may have gone the opposite direction and could be very, very different from, from system level sensitivity in some of these regions. So it's hard to answer specifically. Do you speak with farmers? Do I speak with farmers? Um, sure, occasionally. Um, yeah, that's a good suggestion. I, I will ask them why. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, we, we, work with, we work with lots of different agronomists from uh, across the U.S. from Michigan State uh, to address e reasons. And the reason you, you, you propose in terms of uh, deeper rooting depths are, are all issues that have been proposed, and we're, we're trying to explore which of those technological uh, explanations best fits the model. But, This might be somewhat controversial, but I've seen presentations of a couple of the AgMet intermodel comparisons. And this huge, even though many of the models share the same assumptions, there's huge variation in what they're predicting. You, know, you can almost choose a model for whatever outcome you want. And you know, you have this fantastic group here, but if you look at experiments which are actually looking at, well, how does CO2 affect a crop when it's combined with temperature or drought or whatever, the database is incredibly small. So as a community, are we getting the balance right here? I mean, as I see it, the modeling groups are expanding exponentially, the number of models we have. And the data they're using is almost non-existent. Right, and so, um, you know, obviously we need more face experiments. We need more, um, we need more similar studies to look at the, the, the fundamental responses of plants and crops, to especially to CO2 uh, and the interactions with water. Um, but yeah, I mean, my approach, uh, you know, again, is is to at least try uh, to the as great extent possible to, um, you know, let's see, to try to a great extent possible to uh, confront these these models with historical data in order to in order to try as best we can not just face data but large scale aggregate yield data, uh, after transpiration data as far as it's available. Um, to, to try and confront them with data and see which models perform best in which circumstances and what we can learn about what is the best model of ET is it, you know, is Robert Robertson to perform better in, 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 in Canada in colder climates or just et cetera, et cetera. And to see if we can start to get into the nuts and bolts of these different models and why different models can make different model choices. As I say, within the modeling space there are easily there's a model for every for every situation and you can definitely pick and choose which one you want. Which is why I think you know the goal of, of a lot of the agri projects is to try and use as many as possible to try and confront them with as much data as possible and to try
trying to see which perform best in which situations and why. So. And uh, just to show you an example of this, so this is the, the prototype results from this first phase of this GDC which is, um, which is a, 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 um, a, 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 um, a key map of the, of the sort of the, uh, the, the, a skill metric, I won't go into what skill metric, but a skill metric from seven different models uh, evaluated <laughs> over nine different kinds of forcing data sets. So on the vertical axis are nine different kinds of forcing data sets. On the horizontal axis are seven different models. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 big, the big plot on the right is for the US data index 240. And then I show a couple of examples from, I think, maybe China and India there on the left. Uh, and this is probably maze, but you can see um, the significant variations for the model's performance, both uh, across different climate products, across different models, different models perform uh, better or worse in different contexts. And what we find is that, probably unsurprisingly, <coughs> there's no model that performs best everywhere. Uh, the models that were, you know, that are uh, from European groups that have been calibrated throughout Europe tend to perform better in Europe. 